my interpretation. Uh, but in any case, this, the symposium today has uh, Stephen Kent of the University of Chicago talking about total chemical synthesis of proteins, which was one of the prime goals of Anfinson's work on uh, refolding in vitro. Bruce Fury, an alumnus of the lab, talking about his work with the PDI enzyme. And then Arthur Horwich uh, of Yale, who's done very elegant work on chaperonins and how they relate to the folding that Anfinson studied in vitro in the cell. Then we'll have half a dozen comments by alumni alumni of the laboratory from about uh, 3.15 to, uh, and including myself, to about 4.30, and then a reception in the Terrace Lounge for all those who were able to uh, join us there. But l let me begin now by in introducing Dr. Kent. Um, Dr. Kent uh, is a pro professor at, at the University of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Chicago. He's originally from New Zealand and uh, was trained in organic chemistry at Berkeley, but then joined Bruce Merrifield at the Rockefeller University for the six or seven years in which the, was, was key to the work from Merrifield on developing solid phase synthesis. And subsequently was on the faculty at Caltech as well as in several biotechnology companies, but in the last 20 years has been at, primarily at the University of Chicago working on uh, chemical synthesis of proteins. And I'm very pleased that he can join us today to talk about these studies. Personally met face to face with Chris Amphenson, but during my time as a postdoctoral fellow and then as an assistant professor in the Merrifield lab at the Rockefeller University, I was the frequent recipient of phone calls from Chris as he worked on his attempted total chemical synthesis of staph nuclease. So he would call up and say, I tried doing this reaction, this is what happened, what do I do next? So I was, uh, had a good telephonic relationship with him. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, how the thermodynamic hypothesis of Chris Amphenson uh, impacted our work on the total chemical synthesis of proteins. So although his thermodynamic hypothesis is actually quite sophisticated and quite complex in its details, it's usually reduced to the statement that the native folded structure of a protein molecule is determined by the protein's amino acid sequence. And that turns out to be key. If you wanted to make proteins by total chemical synthesis, uh, you needed to have Chris Amphenson come up with this insight. So, uh, the total chemical synthesis of enzymes and other protein molecules was actually one of the grand challenges of synthetic organic chemistry and chemistry in general in the 20th century. So the goal was first enunciated by Emil Fischer, uh, actually uh, in his Nobel Prize speech in 1902, and then in terms of his overwhelming ambition to uh, be the first to prepare an enzyme by total chemical synthesis in this excerpt from a letter to Adolf Bayer written in 1905. Uh, Fischer and his uh, successors uh, were able to make uh, peptides. Fischer founded the science of peptide uh, chemistry, but he was never able to uh, accomplish the total synthesis of an enzyme. So amongst other issues, um, he needed uh, protein sequence data. So let's quickly review what would be involved in making an enzyme by total chemical synthesis. So at the top here, we have an enzyme that will become in cartoon form that will become familiar to you in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. And the precursor to this folded disulfide cross-linked enzyme molecule is a linear polypeptide chain. So for small enzymes, this may be as small as 120 to 150 amino acids. Uh, for larger, uh, more complex en enzymes, it's typically around 300 amino acids, so quite a long polypeptide chain beyond the capability of even uh, peptide chemists, even today, to make 
in a stepwise one amino acid at a time fashion. So the precursor to this has to be a series of shorter peptide segments, 30 or 40 amino acids long, uh, that have been made by total chemical synthesis. So in, in organic chemistry, this is referred to as a retrosynthetic analysis, courtesy of E.J. Corey. Lots of Nobel laureates will be mentioned today. So as I uh, said before that last slide, if you want to undertake the total chemical synthesis of a protein, the first thing you need to know is its covalent structure. And although uh, Fischer and Hofmeister, uh, apparently independently of one another, but at the same symposium in, uh, I think, 1904 anyway, uh, enunciated the uh, peptide theory of protein structure, namely that peptides were linear sequences, excuse me, proteins were linear sequences of amino acids um, linked uh, head to tail. Uh, the first sequence of a protein molecule was determined by Fred Sanger in the 1950s, and then is shown here, uh, along with the picture of the actual insulin protein. And if you were a protein molecule, this is what you would see coming at you. And especially if you were the insulin receptor. And this is a cartoon representation. Um, we'll see a lot of cartoon representations during this uh, short uh, presentation. So after the uh, determination of the structure of the, co the excuse me, the covalent structure of insulin, um, similar techniques, chemical techniques, were used to work out the amino acid sequence and disulfide bond connectivity of a variety of other proteins, most importantly the lysozymes. Uh, for, at least importantly for this talk. So hen egg white lysozyme was the prototypical sequence uh, shown here, 129 amino acids uh, determined here at the NIH. Um, and many other species of egg white lysozyme uh, enzyme had their amino acid sequences determined. And... It's trying to get me to join the network. We'll see if we can ignore it. And uh, ultimately, by 1971, even the sequence of human lysozyme had been determined. Um, human lysozyme, of course, is an antibiotic that is secreted uh, in tears and takes care of bacteria that would otherwise eat your eyeballs, which would be bad in general. Anyway, with this kind of sequence information known in the early 70s, the stage was set for one of the preeminent synthetic organic chemists of his era, George Kenner in the UK, uh, to undertake the total chemical synthesis of the enzyme lysozyme using a simplified consensus sequence of 129 amino acids uh, by comparing all the different sequence information that was available at the time. So his synthetic scheme consisted of making 12 smaller, fully protected peptide segments and stitching them together uh, to give two final large chunks of roughly 65 amino acids each that would then be connected. All that was successfully um, undertaken and achieved by his team of uh, approximately 16 very talented scientists, many of whom went on to uh, independent careers and great success in their own right. Um, unfortunately, um, as was the case for almost all of these uh, syntheses attempted by conventional organic chemistry, this was not successful. Uh, this work is summed up in the uh, Bakerian lecture in 1977 that Kenner gave. Um, a sad part of the story is that Kenner was so depressed by this failure he actually committed suicide. So that's not good either. Okay, so... Let's do one slide's worth of what was right and what was wrong about convergent um, conventional synthesis. So the concept is uh, excellent. The idea is that you take building blocks and stitch them together convergently, so not stepwise, but uh, build the two halves of the molecule and then stitch those together. Um, you can then purify intermediate reaction products uh, you use maximal protection of other functional groups present in the amino acid side chains of the protein's polypeptide chain in order to prevent side reactions. However, 
it turns out the protected peptides would rather interact with each other than with a solvent, which translates in real life to the fact that they aren't very soluble, they precipitate. Even if you can keep them in solution, it's low con at low concentrations, and you get very poor yields of the uh, bimolecular reactions that you're performing. There are other side reactions that are also um, inherent in this approach. You've also masked all the groups that allow you to purify things well, and uh, that makes uh, analytical, analytical control also very difficult. So a new approach was needed, and I was fortunate enough uh, to come up with such an approach that has turned out to work quite well and is now widely used throughout the world. And that's chemical ligation, and it's a creative form of cheating. We knew that we could keep unprotected peptides. We could make them, purify them, um, show that they were purified, keep them in solution. What we needed was a way of stitching them together. And uh, that was non-trivial in the first instance, but by looking at it from a, a, a completely different viewpoint, I realized that if you were not worried about making a peptide bond at the site where you joined the peptides together, it actually uh, rendered the problem trivial. So here's an example of high school synthetic organic chemistry. Take two peptides with all their functional groups and put two unique mutually reactive functionalities, one on each piece, the only thing there, they will react with each other, but not with any of the other functionalities that are present. And that's called a chemoselective reaction. And you generate a ligation product. The price you paid for simplifying the challenge is that you don't have an amide bond where you stitch the two peptides together. Using this chemistry, you end up with a thioester, which is a reasonable mimic of an amide bond, but has Many people, many of my colleagues throughout the world, after we published this in science, were moved to comment, you know, you're cheating, it's not a real amide bond. Um, however, the proteins didn't care, so after all the um, struggles of Chris to make staph uh, nuclease, here's an example of making um, the HIV-1 protease using two synthetic peptides, um, the chemistry that I showed on the previous slide, you can make tens of milligrams of correctly folded uh, fully active enzyme molecules. This just shows the measure of the enzymatic activity. So this all of a sudden uh, rendered accessible all sorts of proteins, but there was still this protest that we weren't actually making amide bonds. We were making thioester-linked products. And I was uh, a victim of chairing a session in public where you sat up on the stage at a scientific conference and the people in the session were busy saying you're making thioesters, not amides. So while they were talking, um, I thought, well, if we put in an extra methylene group and on that methylene group we have a nitrogen atom, an amino group, then one could imagine an intramolecular nucleophilic attack through a favoured five-membered ring to generate an amide bond. So our challenge boiled down uh, using this idea was how do we make this intermediate? And Phil Dawson, who is now Dean of Graduate Studies at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla and Professor of Chemistry, was a second year graduate student in my lab and he figured out how to make this very efficiently. And this is the key to the well-known native chemical ligation reaction. Take a peptide thioester, a peptide with an amino terminal cysteine residue. doesn't matter if there are other cysteines. Um, this thiolate form of this N-terminal cysteine attacks the thioester. This is a reversible reaction. It generates this intermediate, which irreversibly um, is uh, converted to a, a native amide bond. The reactions are carried out uh, at neutral pH, an aqueous solution where unprotected peptides from globular proteins are freely soluble. And to make sure they stay in solution, we use a solubilizing agent, 6-molar guanidine hydrochloride, typically, and an aryl thiol catalyst that promotes the reversibility of this reaction. And that's key to the regio selectivity. If you have other cysteines, it doesn't matter because eventually they'll end up um, 
in this form and irreversibly be converted to the desired product. So we're almost there, except that even a long polypeptide chain is not a protein. So if we remember our retrosynthetic analysis, only now we're looking at the synthetic direction. We know how to make the peptides using optimized versions of Bruce Merrifield solid phase synthesis. We know how to characterize them. Um, we know how to stitch them together using the chemistries I've just described. We need to know how to fold them. And fortunately, uh, by the time we'd figured out how to make the long polypeptide chains, the folding problem in practical terms, based on Chris Amphenson's thermodynamic hypothesis, had been worked out for the um, fledgling biotechnology pharmaceutical industry between the mid-1980s and mid-1990s. And the principal contributor to that work was Rainer Rudolph at Halle in the former East Germany. And uh, his work uh, in that area is summarized in this article that I've cited. The principles are uh, straight out of the Chris Amphenson playbook. Uh, it's equilibrium folding, not kinetic, so exclude oxygen and metals. You want to keep the aggregating, misfolded intermediates, uh, stop them from precipitating. So you need what is commonly called a denaturant, only it's actually helping the protein uh, form the native structure. And to encourage disulfide formation, you need a redox couple, which usually has an excess of oxidizing power, so that it's the equilibrium folded thermodynamic minimum um, state of the protein that determines the disulfides and the correct fold. All uh, straight out of Chris Amphenson's work. So let me illustrate this with human lysozyme. Uh, total synthesis performed by Thomas Durek, a, a, a postdoc in my lab. So rather than having a team of 16 people, as in the Kenner work, I now have one postdoc doing this, all manually, no machines involved, except for the analytical control. So the target is 130 uh, amino acid residue polypeptide chain, which, when, when, which contains eight cysteine residues, when correctly folded, has four disulfide bonds. So this was made from four synthetic peptides. One, two, three, four. Over here, we have a native chemical ligation reaction to give one half of the molecule. Over here, we have a variation on that where we leave out the thioaryl catalyst, and then we can condense a thioaryl ester with a thioalkyl ester and end up with the other half of the polypeptide chain as a thioester. A final native chemical ligation step, the full length polypeptide chain, which is folded to give the correctly folded enzyme with full enzymatic activity. This shows the last step in that synthesis, the condensation of a 64 residue polypeptide chain with a 66 residue polypeptide chain. You can tune this reaction rate. Uh, Thomas obviously wanted to go home and grab some sleep. So after 12 hours, he had a near quantitative uh, reaction. We used a slight excess of one component. So in atom economy terms, 80% of the reactants have ended up in the product, which is uh, quite extraordinary for such high molecular weight reactants. So this purified product is the uh, linear polypeptide chain is then folded under standard conditions again. So it's slightly elevated pH in the presence of a redox couple generated by these two reactants. This is the starting material. This is the crude folding reaction, and this is the purified synthetic protein. Uh, you can tell that the four disulfides have formed from the mass difference. And to characterize the synthetic protein, we check its purity, that it has the correct mass that it has a unique fold, usually uh, shown by multidimensional NMR, determine the structure of the folded synthetic protein by X-ray diffraction methods. This shows the quality of the electron density map for the chemically synthesized enzyme. At the time, so this was 10 years ago, this was the highest resolution crystal structure of human lysozyme. And then finally, after all this characterization, 
it makes sense to see whether it actually works as an enzyme, and in this case it does. It's uh, digesting the proteoglycans that form up the armour of the bacteria and stop it from exploding in um, G2 osmotic pressure. So now we have a general way of making proteins uh, using chemistry. We can start with an amino acid sequence of a protein molecule, bottles of white powder, uh, using the chemistries I've described, make the full-length polypeptide chain, fold it based on Chris Amphenson's work, and then carry out structure activity um, relationship studies to figure out what makes the protein tick, which is the whole point. So I thought I'd finish off this presentation by talking about one of the really unusual things you can do with total chemical synthesis. So all proteins that are found in nature, on this planet anyway, are made up of L amino acids and the A chiral amino acid um, glycine. For the less scientific members of the audience, you've got chiral uh, models uh, with you. This is a left hand, this is a right hand. These are chiral objects non-superimposable on their mirror images. In uh, molecular terms, the chiral objects are called enantiomers. So, um, all natural proteins from ribosomal synthesis are left-handed. Uh, this is a right-handed protein. How do we get there? Well, uh, the key is Amphenson's thermodynamic hypothesis. It implies, I'm not sure it was explicitly stated, it may have been, but I never found it, um, that if you use D amino acids, mirror image amino acids, and the A chiral amino acid glycine, then you will get a mirror image protein. And uh, just to be absolutely explicit about this, here we have the D mirror image form of HIV1 protease admiring itself uh, in the mirror, where it's in the natural form. And the way that was generated is actually shown here. It's by the original um, high school synthetic organic chemistry. So as well as making the L form of the enzyme in almost 50 milligram yield in a low-scale research lab uh, synthesis, uh, we also carried out the same synthesis with D amino acids, and we ended up with roughly the same yield of the mirror image protein. And of course, the Enzymes uh, carry out chiral reactions. In this case, they, uh, this enzyme chews up peptides, which are chiral entities. So the L enzyme works on the L peptide, but does not work on the mirror image peptide substrate, the D peptide. And the mirror image enzyme does not work on the natural substrate, but cleaves the mirror image substrate uh, with equal uh, velocity. Incidentally, I couldn't find the slide, but when we first folded these synthetic HIV-1 protease molecules, we went to all sorts of elaborate folding protocols. Uh, this protein doesn't have disulfides, and if you just take the polypeptide and dilute it into the assay, you immediately get the same data as you see here. So the protein folds like that, even under assay conditions. So can you use mirror image proteins for anything? Well, you can use them for a couple of things. So the first thing you can do is help the structural biologists out of a major um, problem or challenge in their X-ray crystallography uh, structure determination of proteins. So thanks to the largely NIH-funded structural genomics programs, we have wonderful statistics on the success rate for crystallizing uh, globular protein molecules. And so here you see almost 48,000 uh, purified polypeptides, uh, proteins, of which only 32% crystallized, and only half of those crystals are diffraction quality. And there's much more sophisticated data now, and it turns out that there's an 80% failure rate, despite all the tricks that we know how to play. So one way of overcoming this hurdle to protein structure determination uh, was predicted by Todd Yates in 1995 in a theoretical article and then uh, inadvertently uh, reduced to experimental practice by us when we were trying to figure out the structure of snow flea antifreeze protein 10 years ago. And that's to take a mirror image uh, 
pyroprotein and antium as the two mirror images prepared by chemical synthesis and mix them one to one so you have a racemic solution. Uh, this actually greatly facilitates crystallization, the formation of diffraction quality crystals. It also greatly simplifies the phase problem in solving the structure because all phases are now quantized and related by zero and pi radians. So we're going to focus here just on this facilitated crystallization. So this has now been used in, in uh, a lot of labs uh, throughout the world. Uh, we've done about 20 uh, of these racemic crystallization um, structures or attempted structures. And this just shows some of them. This was the original one, Snowfly antifreeze protein. And a bunch of other ones, including this interesting guy over here, which is key to um, how mycobacterium tuberculosis enters persistent dormancy. So almost all of these are proteins that could not be crystallized uh, as normal L proteins, despite everyone's best efforts. Uh, what we found is that in these 20 instances, we had about an 85% success rate. Um, and this corresponds with experience in other labs throughout the world. So we seem to have dramatically uh, changed the ability to get diffraction quality crystals by this use of a racemic mixture of chemically synthesized proteins. So what else can you do with a D protein? So this is vascular endothelial growth factor type A. It's the target for uh, two of Genentech's early blockbuster drugs, Avastin and Lucentis. Uh, this is actually the work from Bart de Vos and the uh, protein group at Genentech back in the 1990s. This is the molecule that was used to develop those two drugs. So it's a covalent homodimer of 102 residue polypeptide chains with eight cysteines. Uh, this is a real challenge for Chris Amphenson's thermodynamic hypothesis. So we set out to make the mirror image protein. So the convention in the field is the lowercase single letter code for amino acids or D-amino acids, and the glycine is still shown on uppercase. So we needed this, and I'll show you why in a moment. And we made it from three synthetic peptides. The series of reactions was carried out without any purification of intermediate products. This is the total crude product mixture from which the full length 102 residue polypeptide was readily uh, separated and purified and had the correct mass. And this shows you the raw mass spec data. The folding was carried out again under the standard conditions of a slightly elevated pH uh, a low concentration of kaotrope to facilitate keeping misfolded forms as part of the equilibrium, a redox mixture, and uh, as you can see here, I mean, it's actually really interesting. The protein polypeptide chain really does know how to get to the final answer. Okay, so here's the beginning. Here's after a day where you've got misfolded forms, and they all shuffle down under these conditions to give you an almost quantitative yield of correctly folded material. And now, instead of having uh, just a 12 kilodalton protein, you have a 24 kilodalton covalently linked protein molecule. And um, Kalyanaswar Mandal, a postdoc in my lab, uh, did all this work and uh, also determined the crystal structure, which it turns out is actually the mirror image of the recombinantly produced protein. So these were, were done uh, 15 years apart by totally different methods, um, and yet the mirror image shapes are evident. So what do we do with this mirror image vascular endothelial growth factor? Uh, we can take advantage of the work of the Peter Kim lab, then at the Whitehead Institute at MIT, so Tom Schumacher et al., uh, in their ingenious mirror image peptide phage display uh, uh, technology, I guess. Anyway, it's a, it's a wonderful invention. The idea was if you want to develop a peptide that will work, a mirror image peptide, D peptide, that will work against an L protein target, take the L protein target, use chemistry to make it in, in a mirror image form, 
phage display of peptide libraries, a somewhat topical uh, subject, uh, thanks to the Nobel Prize for that uh, just recently. And then uh, you're going to end up with a, an L peptide, which you can affinity, uh, maximize the affinity of. You've now got a wonderful L peptide against the mirror image of vascular endothelial growth factor, and that will be good for treating people in a mirror image world. But in our world, you now need to take the sequence information for this peptide ligand and use chemistry to make it in the mirror image form. And because of the principles of symmetry, this D-peptide will be a high affinity specific ligand for the original protein molecule. And with Dev Sidhu and Maruti Upalopati at, uh, in Toronto, uh, we adapted the mirror image peptide phage display uh, using VEGFA, so made it in mirror image form. Now we're screening protein libraries, small protein scaffold, develop a high affinity L protein ligand, make it in mirror image form, and now we have an engineer D protein that's specific for natural VEGFA. And we would like to know how it binds to the VEGFA and how that compares with how Avastin, which is... Um, an antibody, and uh, Lucentis, which is a truncated antibody, uh, compare those binding sites to what is going on here. Uh, so we use racemic crystallography. Why not? So LVEGF made by chemistry, its mirror image also made by chemistry, and then two equivalents of the mirror image forms of the identified uh, small protein ligand mixed together and uh, greatly facilitated crystal formation, uh, synchrotron diffraction, uh, X-ray diffraction data collected to 1.6 angstroms. Uh, all of these centrosymmetric crystals, I'm sorry, all of these racemic crystals are centrosymmetric. Solved by molecular replacement, and this just shows you the um, a heterochiral uh, protein complex uh, in a centrosymmetric crystalline array. So this is the center of sym symmetry through which everything is reflected. Here we have VEGF of the natural L-handedness with a D-protein bound to either end. And its mirror image, uh, D-VEGF, has an L-protein bound to each end. And the protein data bank uh, is kind enough to add a a feature called structure weight. So the structure weight here is 73 kilodaltons, all made by chemical synthesis. So what I wanted to emphasize in closing is that all of this is based on Chris Amphenson's work. Uh, the central dogma of protein science, namely that the amino acid sequence uh, has information that codes for the folded structure uh, at a thermodynamic minimum. And it's that structure that uh, dictates uh, the function of the protein, in this case, human lysosome. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll go now. Take some questions. Good. It's not it have an extra sulfur group after the, uh, the ligation, uh, does that not interfere with uh, folding? Uh, no, I see what you're saying. What you're actually saying is what say it's not a natural cysteine. If it's a natural cysteine, it's not a problem, right? You've just created the cysteine that you're going to use for, to form a disulfide. Yes, if, if you... Uh, don't have a native sustain at what, what you would like to be a ligation site. You just put one there, and now you've got an extra sustain. But the trick there is to protect the other ones, and then you can desulfurize, and it becomes an alanine. Or you can use beta thiol anything, and then it becomes that amino acid, and then you can go ahead and deprotect the native sustains. Yeah. Thank you.